Every once in a while, a TV show comes along that's so wonderfully weird it strikes a chord with viewers of all ages and backgrounds. Rick and Morty surprised cartoon fans everywhere when it debuted back in 2013, and it's only gotten more popular from there. Which is why 107 Piddly Little Facts could never fully encapsulate such an amazing show. My name is Tim with Channel Frodorator, and today we're going even deeper into the backstory of this dynamic duo. Are you a diehard fan? Just wondering why everyone loves this show so much? We've got something for everyone as we count down 107 more facts you should know about about Rick and Morty. Let's get started. <laughs> Number 1. Dan Harmon and Justin Roiland have been pitching shows together since 2005. The first show they pitched to Fox was a sci-fi, and although the network passed, the show went on to evolve and inspire a lot of Rick and Morty. Number 2. Harmon actually began developing Rick and Morty after he was fired from his position as executive producer on his show Community. Harmon makes his feelings on the matter apparent in Season 2 when he references the show and parodies its characters on television in the episode Autoerotic Assimilation. Number 3. Just before Harmon called him about doing a show for Adult Swim, Roiland was in the process of developing an incarnation of Rick and Morty for Fox that was more grounded in reality. This scrapped pitch revolved around a grandfather who was close to death moving in with his daughter, a single mother who worked at a hair salon, and his impressionable grandson. The grandfather was an overall terrible person, and because he was so close to death would coax his grandson into helping him commit a series of horrible crimes. So other than the single mother and close to death bits, not much change. Number 4. Roiland has always been a huge fan of Adult Swim, so much so that he planned to make Rick and Morty only 15 minutes from the start to fit in with their original content. Harmon pushed the idea of doing 22 minute episodes because it would mark a first for the network. Number 5. The creators knew it would be a battle to get the show approved, but they also knew that if they could get the show to a focus group, they would more than likely be greenlit. Sure enough, the network wasn't sold on the show in the beginning. After the pilot, they ordered two scripts as a trial. Number 6. Contrary to popular belief, Harmon and Roiland never showed the real adventures of Doc and Marty to Adult Swim when they originally pitched Rick and Morty, as it would have obviously destroyed the duo's odds of getting the show picked up. Roiland has gone on record saying he even went through an unsuccessful effort to remove the short from the internet during the pitch process. To his knowledge, the executives over at Adult Swim still haven't seen it, and Roiland thinks it's better that way. Number 7. Doc and Marty aren't the only versions of Rick and Morty created by Roiland. Rougher versions of the duo's voices and designs have appeared throughout several Roiland failed pilots, including the Poloni Family Comedy Show, Relative Insanity, and The Unmarketables. Number 8. Adult Swim went all out with Rick and Morty's marketing campaign prior to the first season's premiere. In December 2013, the citizens of New York City may have noticed flyers on lampposts inquiring about buying a used spaceship. If you were to go to 23rd Broadway, you would see that Rick's ship had crash landed in front of the Flatiron Building with Morty still inside. Rick could be seen sitting on a bench nearby, feeding his alcoholism. Number 9. Adult Swim had a similar installation at an Adult Swim themed carnival outside San Diego Comic Con in 2015, with Rick crashing his spaceship into the ground another time. Only this time, he's triumphantly walking away from the wreckage with beer bottles at his feet. According to Roiland, this particular installation received backlash from various anti-drunk driving organizations for promoting drunk driving. In fairness, I think that anything Rick does shouldn't be counted as promoting. Number 10. Harmon and Roiland share similar taste in music, but Harmon takes none of the credit when it comes to the excellent soundtrack for Rick and Morty. Number 11. Roiland's favorite episode of the series so far is Rick Potion Number 9 from Season 1. He claims he loves the episodes for the fast-paced action and unavoidable dark ending, which if you create of the show, I think you can say that the ending was avoidable for you. Number 12. Roiland voiced characters in an unofficial stop-motion animated episode of Rick and Morty created by fan Dieter Wagner. Number 13. Once during a visit to New York City, Roiland visited a strip club where he got so drunk that he began talking to the dancers in the voices of Rick and Morty. Unfortunately, he didn't have the money to tip anybody, but he got around this by finding dancers that were fans of Rick and Morty and paid them in character sketches on napkins. Number 14. Rick and Morty's theme song wasn't actually created for the show. It was originally the theme song of Roiland's failed pilot called Dog World. You can see other Dog World references in Rick and Morty. Number 15. According to Roiland, the small W-shaped mouth the characters occasionally make is a specific reference to a similar expression that Ren frequently makes on Ren and Stimpy. Number 16. Many people have suspected that Roiland and Harmon may take hallucinogens to help them write the show, but this is not the case. It turns out they just have weird sick minds. Number 17. The writers admit they try not to worry about a offending people. Once you do that, you put restrictions up in the writer's room which can block the flow of creativity. So even though it's not their attention to offend people, they don't try to avoid it. Number 18. Although the show 
Tarantino parodies a lot of famous movies, the writers never start off with a movie in mind. Instead, it just sort of happens organically during the writing process. Which, when we're talking about Rick Potion number 9, is pretty easy to see, but when you have an episode centered around The Purge? Number 19, the Rick and Morty outline dictates that the story exhausts what audiences already know within the first act, so the show never becomes boring or slow. And I appreciate this, because even if you start with a common trope, there's still plenty more to explore. Number 20, Rick and Morty's own Ryan Ridley used to freelance to a company that bought slogans to mass produce on t-shirts. In fact, Ridley is the man behind the classic t-shirt, quote, I do my own stunts, which was initially, I do my own stunts, they're just really lame. The company had to edit it down. Number 21, most of the designs start off as less of an idea and more just a general feeling that the writers try and capture on a whiteboard. Royland really wants to release a Rick and Morty concept art book because so many awesome characters and designs only get used once in the show. Number 22, Adult Swim allows the writing staff to explore their creative freedoms and push the envelope as far as the jokes go. But Harmon has said that this adds pressure on the writers because if the show dips in quality, they have no one else to blame. Number 23, Harmon and Royland admit the secret influence behind many of the alien designs is excrement and genitals. Some may be more apparent than others, such as the Zagarians from the season two premiere. Number 24, Adult Swim initially didn't want Royland to voice Rick and Morty. Harmon was able to convince them to let Royland voice Rick, but Morty was still an uncertainty. Adult Swim was originally looking to have the likes of Billy West or Tara Strong voice the character before Royland was able to win the network over with a few auditions he did playing both Rick and Morty. Number 25, all of the characters' backstories are already thought out and haven't been revealed by choice. The writers will reveal all according to plan, but until then, you only get subtle hints. Number 26, according to Royland, Rick is openly pansexual. This claim is further supported by his relationship with Unity, who is consistently referred to as it, as opposed to he or she. Number 27, Sarah Chalk auditioned for the role of Beth over the phone while she was staying at her friend's cabin in Canada. Number 28, aside from Rick, Beth is really Dan's favorite character. He relates to her and feels the character is really grounded and very real. Number 29, Royland claims that Chris Parnell always nails his lines for Jerry on the first take. Despite this, the show's standard operation procedure mandates that one take is simply not enough, so Parnell usually gives them around 30 perfect takes of a line. Roland almost always uses the first take, though. Number 30, when Parnell was asked who would win a rap battle between his most popular characters, Archer's Cyril Figgis, 30 Rock's Dr. Spaceman, and Jerry Smith, he voted for Jerry Smith. Parnell claims this was simply a gut feeling. Number 31, the idea of Jerry and Beth's relationship spawned from how marriage is often portrayed in media with the constant question of, is this going to work, without ever showing a resolution. Also, the creators liked the idea because they felt it's a more realistic portrayal of most relationships. You have the single worst marriage I've ever witnessed. Number 32, the reason Jerry's father enjoys watching his wife have sex with another man while dressed as Superman is because it's the first thing that comes to Harmon's mind whenever he hears about people's odd fetishes. Number 33, it's not referenced too often, but Jerry makes mention of a traumatic childhood a few times in the series. The creators refused to comment on the subject any further, but did imply the possibility of exploring the darker side of his history. Number 34, Jerry appears to be a recurring name for father figures throughout Royland's work. In addition to Rick and Morty, Jerry was also the name of the father character in his failed pilot's dog world and Toro and Moro. An interesting side note, the Jerry and Toro and Moro was actually a genius inventor. Number 35, Rick was originally meant to drive a flying car, but this idea was scrapped when Harmon and Royland realized this was too similar to the flying DeLorean from Back to the Future Part 2, and decided to change it into a UFO to avoid any potential legal issues. Number 36, the website that Rick babbles on about in the pilot, rickandmortyadventures.com, is a working URL that will send you to Adult Swim's website if punched into your browser. Number 37, early on in season one's development, the writers would often pitch ideas and write episodes in Royland's garage, and even during small hiking trips they took together. Number 38, according to Royland, the show's writers discussed incorporating a big secret into the series' overarching plot that would ultimately be kept away from the viewers. The secret was uncovered midway through the first season when the writers found a conspiracy post written by a user on Reddit that was startlingly accurate. Royland hasn't said which post of these he's referring to for obvious reasons. Number 39, many episode concepts begin life as random phrases and desires blurted out by Royland in the writer's room. For example, he may shout something along the lines of, I want a testicle monster to appear in an episode. It's then up to the writing team to build a story around the request. Number 40, ever wonder where Rick and Morty gets its wide range of pop culture references? The Rick and Morty staff collectively refer to writer Mike McMahon as having an encyclopedic knowledge of books, films, and TV shows. He can be found in the writer's room, constantly pitching other writers various sci-fi concepts and jokes based on properties from across the genre's history. Number 41, the A and B 
plots of episode Lawnmower Dog were originally intended to be two separate episodes. One of them solely focused on ripping Inception a new one, while the other was a full-blown Planet of the Apes parody, but with dogs. It was Harmon's idea to merge the two episodes into one in order to showcase how crazy the show could be. Number 42, in the episode Lawnmower Dog, Rick mistakenly refers to Snuffles as Ruffles. Ruffles was the name of the Doggerson's family pet human in Royland's dog world. Number 43, while Harmon's idea was ultimately the path taken by the crew, Lawnmower Dog had a problem combining two dense storylines into one episode. The script wound up being a whopping 40 pages long. That's 10 pages longer than the average Rick and Morty script. This meant scrapping and minimizing a lot of jokes and elements, including a dream world that resembled Middle Earth that became the site of a hot and steamy orgy, which wound up becoming the sex dungeon seen in the actual episode. Number 44, in early drafts of the classroom scene in M. Night Shyamalan's, the classroom was supposed to break out into an orgy between Jessica, Morty, and Mr. Goldenfold and the other students, but was cut for obvious reasons. Number 45, M. Night Shyamalan's plot is based on that of 1964 film 36 Hours. The film revolves around an American GI kidnapped by Germans who attempt to convince him that World War II is over so they can get important allied tactical information. Number 46, Morty was originally meant to rap for the crowd in M. Night Shyamalan's. According to Ridley, one of the verses of this cut rap was a chicken in a peanut and a house with a raisin run around together in a tiny little station. Number 47, in M. Night Shyamalan's, there's a mailman in the simulation who constantly refers to Jerry as my man. This is a reference to the movie Big starring Tom Hanks, in which Hanks's character is greeted by a mailman that exclaims my man upon seeing him. Number 48, in season one, a single episode averaged about 100 jokes, which comes out to about five jokes per minute. Episode eight, Rick's D Minutes, had the highest number of jokes for the season, totaling 146 jokes. Number 49, Rick's D Minutes has an identical concept to one episode of Justin Rowland's older series, House of Cosby's. In the fourth episode, the characters find an intergalactic transmission receptor from an alien spaceship, which they hook up to a television set and watch bizarre alien TV shows from other planets. They're trying to get information, you see. Number 50, Harmon played the Saturday Night Live announcer in Rick's D Minutes. When the announcer goes through the names of the various cast members and reaches the photo of the three strange looking aliens, he says, uh, I'll get back to that one. That was a real bit of confusion on Harmon's part when he was recording the sketch and going through the illustrations. He genuinely didn't know what to make of them. Number 51, the writers don't intend on parodying pop culture often because they feel that instantly puts them in competition with South Park. In fact, the Lawnmower Dog episode was already being written and animated when the South Park Inception episode aired featuring a similar Freddy Krueger plotline. Number 52, to avoid overlapping plotlines with other shows, the creators decided to keep Rick and Morty in the sci-fi genre. So any future references that are made won't likely end up in an episode of South Park. Number 53, when they completed the season one finale, they weren't entirely sure they would be back for another season. If they were picked up, they planned to pick things up exactly where they left off with Rick having to unfreeze time. Number 54, the original ending for autoerotic assimilation wasn't nearly as dark as the final product. It simply called for Rick to angrily tear his lab apart in a fit of rage, only to calm down shortly after. But Harmon thought that wasn't dark enough for Rick. The writers originally opted to have him activate a device that generates a black hole that Rick would contemplate entering. Harmon once again chimed in, saying the writers were on the right track, but he thought the suicide attempt should be somewhat left to chance. Something of an accident. Number 55, the episode Something Ricked This Way Comes features a character named Scroopy Noopers, who's voiced by video game voice acting legend Nolan North. The character was named by Harmon, who is mocking the way Royland comes up with names for his characters. Number 56, in the cold open for Me Seeks and Destroy, the spaceship that Rick and Morty fight demonic versions of the Smith family on resembles the ship Event Horizon from the 1997 science fiction film of the same name. Number 57, the original design for the Ball Fondlers were reminiscent of the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. The Ball Fondlers also existed in a world where people's arms were too short to fondle their junk, hence the name. Number 58, X Gone Give It To You was not originally intended to be the song that played when Rick and Summer got their revenge on the devil. The crew just played a bunch of different songs over the sequence and DMX won out. Number 59, during pickups for close Rick counters of the Rick kind, it was discovered that Chalk could burp on command without the aid of beverages, a talent that I'm sure makes Royland very jealous. This inspired the crew to incorporate the joke of Beth inheriting her father's belching at the last minute. Number 60, the fourth dimensional being seen in A Rickle in Time closely resemble the Langoliers from the Stephen King story of the same name. Both creatures have an association with time. The Langoliers eat it while the fourth dimensional beings police it. Number 61, when the Council of Ricks was first introduced and the multiple Ricks and Mortys were shown, the very first Doc and Marty characters were placed in the scene, but later removed to avoid any legal issues that might come up. Number 62, the badges worn by the Council of Ricks were made into real badges and given to the crew as 
gifts when they wrap production on Season 1. Royland encourages anybody that find ones for sale online to buy it no matter how much it costs. Number 63, Bird Person was modeled after Hawk, a character from the 70s TV series Buck Rogers in the 25th century. Number 64, Harmon Lee jokingly likes to blame what happened to Bird Person in Season 2 on his divorce, but ultimately the beloved fan favorite was gunned down in an attempt to keep the audience on its toes. Number 65, the cyborg photographer seen in The Wedding Squanchers is played by Aaron Hansen, perhaps better known by the name Ego Raptor. He's also responsible for the awesome series One Half of Game Grumps and my personal favorite, Sequelitis. Number 66, Rick's Microverse counterpart Zeep Zanflorp is voiced by none other than Stephen Colbert of The Colbert Report and The Late Show with Stephen Colbert, which makes it appropriate that Zeep's mech suit deploys an eagle. Number 67, Royland is a huge Degrassi fan, to the point where two Degrassi cast members, Cassie Steele and Aislinn Paul, were actually cast for the first season and Steele was brought back for the second season. Number 68, Royland had no idea who Alfred Molina was when he was cast as the devil in season one, something that frustrated Ridley, who is a big fan. When recording wrapped, Ridley asked for a photo with Molina, so Royland did as well. Ridley asked why Royland would want a picture of an actor he didn't know. Royland responded that if Ridley wanted a picture with him, it must have meant he was worth having a picture taken with. Alfred Molina is a prolific actor with a resume boasting such films as Raiders of the Lost Ark, Boogie Nights, and Spider-Man 2. Number 69, famous documentarian Werner Herzog guest starred on the show during season two for the episode titled Interdimensional Cable 2, Tempting Fate. During the episode, Herzog gave a monologue about how humans are fascinated by their own penises. Number 70, Summer's voice actress Spencer Grammer is the daughter of actor Kelsey Grammer, who has also dabbled in the realm of voice acting, most notably as Simpsons villain, Sideshow Bob. Number 71, in a sense, Spencer Grammer really is responsible for developing the character Summer. Before the actor's touch was given to the characters, Summer was essentially a one-dimensional stereotype. Number 72, the top that Summer wears in Raising the Zorpazorp is a real Marc Jacobs top that Royland picked because it looked cute. This did not go unnoticed by Marc Jacobs International, who retweeted an image from the episode commending the show for its incorporation. Number 73, when the episode Raising Gazorpazorp was sent over to standards and practices, the Rick and Morty staff were concerned that the Gazorpian sex robot would be a huge issue that would compromise the episode. In the end, everything went surprisingly well. The only request standards and practices had for the crew was to alter the size and shape of the robot's mouth. Number 74, the Gazorpazorp design was modeled after the alien in the 1985 film Explorers. It's a personal favorite of Royland. Number 75, Adult Swim is not allowed to rerun the episode Raising Gazorpazorp during prime time due to the fact that a 14-year-old boy knocks up a sex robot. Number 76, Rick's use of the word retarded in Something Ricked This Way Comes was an attempt by Harmon to argue a valid use of the word, and expected to receive heavy resistance from the executives at Adult Swim, but he never even heard a peep from them about it. Number 77, during the same episode, Jerry humiliates Morty in front of the Plutonians by telling a story about how Morty threw his poopy underwear out a window when he was younger. This is something Harmon did when he was a child. Number 78, the Rick and Morty puppets used to promote the season one DVD were created by special effect artist and character designer Ben Bameth. Bameth was a finalist on the sci-fi show Jim Henson's Creature Shop Challenge. He's also the boyfriend of Justin's sister, Amy Royland. Number 79, some of the writers may seem a tad under the influence during the DVD commentaries. That's because they were, and because of this, multiple recordings had to take place before they recorded tracks they could use. Number 80, the writers went into season two of Rick and Morty wanting to make Rick more human, and that meant making him more vulnerable and less on top of everybody and everything. One of the ways they displayed this vulnerability in humanity with Rick was auto-erotic assimilation, where Rick's emotions are challenged with his love interest, Unity, and he doesn't come out on top like he always does. To quote Ridley, his reckless behavior begins to bite him in the ass. Number 81, though the writers try to humanize Rick, they refuse to delve too deeply into his backstory. They swear that they'll never reveal things like how or why Rick became an alcoholic. Royland feels that explanations like that take responsibility away from the character's actions and makes them unrealistic. Number 82, originally for the second season, there were plans to revisit the original family left behind in the Cronenberg world. The episode was supposed to be part of the season finale, but the idea was nixed due to writer's block. As good a reason as ever existed. Number 83, the first two episodes of season two were leaked online before their intended release. These episodes were supposed to be released online for the press to review. It's also worth noting the copies of these episodes weren't 100% finished and had subtle animation and sound issues that seemed to have went unnoticed by the general public. Despite the early positive reception they received, Harmon and Royland urged people not to watch the leaked content and view future episodes when and how they were meant to be seen. Number 84, Royland was drawn into the show for an animated cameo. In season two's Get Swifty, he can be spotted tied to balloons and wearing a sign that reads Thief during the first Ascension scene. Number 85, season two, episode four, Total Recall, 
had the most jokes out of the entire season at 150 total jokes. Number 86, the episode Total Recall was inspired by the concept of the character Dawn from Joss Whedon's Buffy the Vampire Slayer. Screenwriter Mike McMahon suggested the idea in the writer's room because he was in love with the concept of a character planting themselves in someone's memory as a disguise. Number 87, how did the parasites in Total Recall get into the Smith residence? Go back a few episodes to Morty Night Run. Towards the end of the episode, you can see Rick loading glowing green rocks into his ship, and if you look closely at these rocks, you'll see tiny pink pods latched to them. At the beginning of Total Recall, Rick is dumping these same green rocks into the trash right over the shoulder of Uncle Steve, the first parasite. According to Justin Roiland, these pink pods on the green rocks are the parasite eggs. Number 88, when he's making burgers in Total Recall, Rick claims that he's good at making burgers like Tom Cruise is good at making drinks in a movie called Cuisine. Its correct title is Cocktail. Number 89, one of the memories the alien parasites plant in Rick's memory is the catchphrase, lick, lick, lick my balls, which he allegedly says all the time. While this isn't true for Rick, it is true of Doc from The Adventures of Doc and Marty. Number 90, at the beginning of The Ricks Must Be Crazy, you can see a poster for Three Brothers, the much anticipated sequel to the critically acclaimed season one joke, Two Brothers. Number 91, the character Aberdoff Linkler was created during a lecture Harmon gave to his writers. During his speech, Dan asked, is there any way you could make Abraham Lincoln or Hitler comedically potent again? Then he basically answered his own question. Number 92, according to Harmon, he was based on a G.I. Joe character named Serpenter, a villain created by Cobra utilizing the combined DNA of Napoleon, Julius Caesar, Hannibal, and Attila the Hun, just as Aberdoff Linkler was created from the combined DNA of Abraham Lincoln and Adolf Hitler. Number 93, the lighthouse keeper in season two was supposed to be voiced by Harmon, but because his monologue was too long, Ridley stepped in to record the monologue with a speedier accent. Number 94, Summer's season two love interest, Toby Matthews, is played by Gravity Falls creator Alex Hirsch. Roiland similarly lent his voice to Gravity Falls, playing the characters Blendon Blandon and Bobby Renza. Number 95, the Gravity Falls Rick and Morty portal gag wasn't the only connection between the two shows. When you're watching Rick and Morty, you may notice a recurring background character with curly blonde hair wearing rainbow suspenders and a shirt featuring American football with Roman numerals on it. This character was meant to serve as a connection between Rick and Morty, Gravity Falls, and an unaired show called Murder Police created by Royland and Hirsch's mutual friend, Jason Ruiz. The Roman numerals on this character's shirt, 1835, correspond with a certain letter of the alphabet. In this case, RCE. And when the same characters appeared in Gravity Falls and Murder Police, the football would feature different sets of numbers. If you put these three codes together, they would reveal a secret message. Unfortunately, Royland was the only one of the three to follow through with this plan, and the secret message will go forever undeciphered. Number 96, the passionate bromance between Royland and Hearst is shown again in Big Trouble in Little Sanchez. When Beth and Jerry begin their couple's counseling, you can see Gravity Falls antagonist Bill Cipher on the computer monitor. Number 97, the Rick and Morty Simpsons couch gag pays tribute to more than just The Simpsons. It also has a few nod to Matt Groening's other show, Futurama. Immediately after exiting the portal, the Planet Express ship can be seen flying through the sky. Morty also walks past a soda machine labeled Slurm, a highly addictive soft drink from Futurama. There's also a man with a brain slug. Number 98, the show's runners didn't want to end season two on a cliffhanger because they thought it was a bad idea. Originally, the finale was going to be a two-part episode, but the writers couldn't settle on an idea for the second part, so instead they left audiences hanging. Number 99, with the writing deadline quickly approaching, a filler episode was written at the last minute to replace the second part of The Wedding Squanchers. That episode being Look Who's Purging Now. Number 100, due to the lack of time, Look Who's Purging Now was written by Harmon in less than a day. While the process was stressful and frustrating for Harmon, he now states it was the most fun he's ever had writing an episode. Number 101, Harmon was struck with inspiration from Star Trek episode Red Hour to make fun of the sci-fi trope of The Purge. Number 102, Harmon rewatched both seasons for inspiration on the third. He's expressed his excitement to finally revisit stuff now that the show is a little more established because he was always paranoid about revisiting things in season two. Number 103, season three will be the first season to feature women in the Rick and Morty writing room. Number 104, Harmon wants to do an episode of Rick and Morty that would transport the characters into a reality much like a Bethesda game. It would tell the story in a style similar to the Elder Scrolls or Fallout games, dialogue options and all. He would also like the art style and animation to reflect the 3D rendered models of their games as well. Number 105, Ridley claims that the writers have seriously discussed creating a comic book spin-off of Rick and Morty called Tales from the Thirsty Step, an anthology of stories focusing on the adventures of the various characters that frequent the Thirsty Step, the bar that Rick and Morty go to in Me Seeks and Destroy. Number 106, the demand for merchandising has gone up since season two so much that even the network is a little shocked. Usually Adult Swim doesn't rush the process, but Hot Topic had been hounding the company to produce more merch for the hungry fans. And finally, number 107, there's a 
strong possibility for a Rick and Morty movie in the future, or at least a television movie. The creators have stated that if they make it to six seasons, they will give a movie some thought. Thanks for watching 107 More Facts You Should Know About Rick and Morty. Which Rick and Morty episode is your favorite? Let us know in the comments. Spoiler alert, it should be something Ricked This Way comes.